my my entire practice if you will is called realm bending and part of that comes from being born but then given up at birth given out of the womb directly into sort of the big empty cosmos of an adoption ward and then taken home by two loving people 10 10 11 days later and i believe as a result of that kind of rupture uh, early on when my biological parents decided that they needed to give me up that i started roaming my consciousness felt the the dropping of love and went and searched for it and so i came out as what in, this, in later years would be called an autistic, autistic or Asperger's kind of a being. Um, it didn't have any such classification in, in the 60s. And so I was just described as my mother as being in my own world and let alone. And I found that my consciousness, even when I was four or five, was traveling the landscape. It was prodding everywhere and poking and moving everywhere. And as a result, my entire life's work has been to, to some extent, travel through time and space. So through time, uh, in the last 20, 30 years, I've been going back through time to find our ancestors, to find the, or more precisely, the mechanism that created life on the earth, that lifted life into being from non-life, from just the physics of warm little ponds and been working on that and we next month the journal astrobiology is publishing our, our total scenario our total hypothesis for how that happened and it's quite beautiful actually it does read kind of like scientific poetry and uh, you're all welcome to to it it's online now called the hot print hot spring hypothesis for the origin of life so that's been my realming through time my realming through space is that I go to, to other planets. I go to the moon, Mars, throughout the solar system uh, in the service of figuring out how we can allow life to extend itself beyond the womb of the Earth. And I've been working with NASA for 20 years and other space agencies to, to design missions and spacecraft and things that are practically would might enable that to happen. So that's realming through space. And as the virus was coming, and to tell you the truth, 30 years ago, I started to see in a kind of forward time realming, a lot of disruptions and waves in the 2020s and 2030s. Uh, I could really see that. So I really kind of aimed my life at being in a place somehow that was, was appropriate for those turbulence to really kick up. And I think I'm there now. Um, I think I bought a farm and uh, you know, built a world uh, to sort of prepare and made a, making a community, really a community is emerging. Valerie and Catherine and Dimitros here and uh, to live in community. I felt that that was the most healthy, sustainable way we might live uh, during the times of the, the big flows. Um, one of the other things that, so, Switching sort of from that mode into a more mystical mode, what if, what if there is something called Gaia? There is something perhaps called the field. Now, Gaia was a, a term that James Lovelock quoted in the, in the 1970s to describe uh, how this immense machine, chemical, evolutionary, message bearing machine called the biosphere, how it regulated itself, how it was an autopoetic system, it was a system that continuously processed material and exquisitely regulated its own environment. And uh, so that was, that was uh, a conception, sort of a mystical conception by a non, you know, a non-mystical scientist. Initially, it was considered as a as a thing that was a little bit woo, but now it's really considered to be true. It's considered to be a real, a real conception that the entire Earth is an autopoetic, cybernetic feedback system, and it can self-repair. And in some journeys, I've actually asked 
the big members of this community, which are the microbial mass, They're the microbial communities that, that layer the earth. They, they cross the entire, all the continents. They're in all the soils. They go through into the marine layer. They, they interlink through the ocean, even to depth. They are in the presence in droplets in the atmosphere. The microbial map wraps around the entire Earth this way, and it's the biggest participant. It's 95% of the story, and 90% of the story of all the history of life on Earth. In our work on the origin of life, we sought to find the common ancestor of that, the microbial map. And we, we are proposing that it was a communal complex of simple protozoa that learned how to share resources and learn how to collect energy and how to ratchet themselves up as a unit. The great discovery of that that's shown is that we didn't come from a common ancestor. There were no common ancestors at the origin of life. There was only a common community, a simple community complex that became more complex. But that indeed, if you see all of life through the lens of this entity, which Carl Woes called the progenome, progeno before life, the unit that carried physical self-assembling protocells and polymers all the way to living, dividing communal microbes. That, that's the progenome. That the progenote itself established a mechanism to do this trick called life, and that it's still a progenote planet. That the Earth as a whole, if, it's, if there is such a thing as Gaia, it's the progenote prerogative we've discovered the fundamental principles now, we believe, of how progenotes worked, how life lifted itself from the background. And these principles can be used to even explain technology, uh, to explain how humans work. Uh, and it's a rolling theory of everything, sort of coming from the pinion, the very beginning of life all the way up through. And it's starting to illuminate things. Uh, so, that's, that's the work I've been doing. One of the things that happened about a year and a half ago is I saw this vision. I, I kept putting in my mind this four billion year track of, from life's origins all the way up. And one night I saw this spire going up. It was a living sculpture. It was like, a, like an icicle moving and seething and breathing. And the, the flat base of it was the microbial map. And that as it got thinner, you could see little blobs in there, little shimmery blobs, and that was the beginning of larger cells, eukaryotes, and those cells getting together into the simplest early animals, animals, plants, algae. And then there was an acceleration in this spire, this silvery spire, and it reached an eruption point, which was, there was an eye there, and it was self-awareness. But this, that, that the blobs had become self-aware, and it could be that some of the blobs were human, some of the blobs were cetaceans, uh, other, other creatures that have self-awareness. And then this was about 98, 99% into that, the spire's rise. But that ahead of us is this new phase from self-awareness to something else, in a sense, awakening, waking up perhaps in Ken Wilber's term, or growing up perhaps, so that we're in this, this period between those two things. And the driving force that, that got us to this point, got us to this improbable four billion year tall point that's above the background of the cosmos. Here's the cosmos. Here we are, we're so improbable. This was driven by the cycling process, driven by the sun's rising and setting every day pushing energy into the system, pushing this probability machine, this genesis engine to drive life to complexity higher and higher and higher. And the whole time, we never had a big interrupt. We never had a planet-destroying asteroid. Uh, we never had a gamma ray burst, none of that. We reached this point, and we're on this point. And one of the things that, that came to me as another mystical experience was that all around this point is this ethereal, set of connections called that I have named the field because it's a, both a woo term, you know, and it's a, a technical term. It's a field is a, a, 
an environment, an ether into which things can interact and transmit and work as a unit. And I think that this field is probability shaping itself. So as human civilization and in our lives have gone on, we find more and more improbable things happening faster and faster. Put, put a thumb up if this is happening to you. But more and more improbable things just keep happening faster, faster, faster. I think that this is the field that results from all this interaction of probability shaping, which life does, interconnected message passing and memory writing and reading, this PIM formalism that came up. Every time it cycles, it generates a resonance with, which talks to other cycles doing the same thing. And it stacks up something that uh, Jewish scholars have called the Akashic field, or Jewish uh, thinkers, but that there's other terms for. There's some kind of collective memory, but a collective transmission system that shapes probability. And we interact with it by having a wish or a desire or an intention we project into the field. And as a result of that, the field sends us all this stuff, these improbable stepping stones that if we step on, we open more improbable valleys and we achieve amazing things. And I think that this, this discovery perhaps, that we have agency in the cosmos, we can, we can do this thing. We can, we can, no matter what comes our way, we can project a beautiful outcome. We can come up with a complex dream a wish and pay attention to it and it will shape probability and it, it's kind of like in a sense a god for geeks because it's just a big os that has the services layer that's not a, a person in a beard that's judging us it is a service this this field and so in this time of stress we can look at we can look at that as it as something to interact with, to connect with, and it will guide us through this. Now, the second question you might ask, so one question you could ask is how do we get through this? That's one tool. The second question is, why is this happening? Well, in, when I was a kid in Canada, they, hunters had, or somehow had shot all the wolves where we lived in British Columbia. There was just no wolves in this whole area. And at the same time, loggers had cut down all the trees, so there was this foraging, uh, grasses everywhere. Uh, and as a result, the deer population exploded. Up to the point, you know, the Turners will probably have seen this in Montana, up to the point where a virus raged through the deer population and it, it crashed. It was quite a remarkable thing. Several million deer died. And then, uh, through the reintroduction of wolves, uh, balance was reestablished because they realized they needed more predators than they had and because they had created more foraging areas through logging. So it was when British Columbia woke up to the reality that, hey, we actually have to care about equilibria here. Uh, and I think this is what's happening here. I think that Gaia and the biosphere or the, is simply doing what's natural to it. Uh, there's disequilibria, uh, and even at the origin of life, we had disequilibria across membranes. We had disequilibria of energy gradients that needed to get life started. We have the disequilibria of so much impact and so much energetic traffic across the earth, trips, products being made and shipped, people on what they see as urgent missions, you know, a lot of doing. And that's created a, a huge disequilibria away from what actually is healthy in, in terms of a homeostasis in the system uh, for the health of the system. And the system itself is adjusting. And the tool mechanism that's used in biology uh, are contagious diseases or pandemics to reduce numbers. And this system is ancient, the system of viruses as control mechanisms and as carriers of genetic information and drivers of evolution is probably as old as life's origins. It's probably the concept of virus uh, emerged during the progenote period. So just offering that to you that 
this is the, the, the cool detached view of this thing that there's going to, there's a trimmer that's trimming around the edge of the lawn, but I want to kind of assure maybe myself and us that it's not the lawn mower. It's not going to cut all of us down because this one, unlike other pandemics of the past is, it's a soft one. There's a Spanish flu of 1918-1919, which attacked preferred healthy adults from 20 to 40. And it just kept erupting all over the world for about a year and a half, including Vancouver, where my, my ancestors were living. Many family members were lost in that period. So the, in a sense, it's Gaia's gentle intervention Matt Segal, who's on this, uh, uh, this Zoom, has written a beautiful essay about this. It's an intervention. It's, it's an interruption. It's something coming in that isn't that severe yet uh, that is a warning shot. It's a, it's a pulling back. It's almost like a comb going through the population, perhaps taking a fraction of us, maybe a small fraction in this, this phase. But it's, it's an informational teacher of a comb in that it's also teaching us, and this is where it more comes back to the heart, matters of the heart, teaching us that we need to get close with people again. We need to slow down. We've all seen the memes of this coming around and we've all had these thoughts from Slow down, stop. Stop with the travel, stop with the buying and the doing, if we can, some of us can't. Uh, but just look each other in the eye. We can look at Catherine in the eye now. Appreciating her getting a connection. And looking you in the eye. Um, to slow down and, and sense what it was like 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago when we didn't, uh, we weren't so overdriven. We weren't so driven by tasks. And at the same time, we're going to lose loved ones. So everyone's going to be, have their heart touched by the loss of these people. And it's going to ground us and land us out of the kind of mania, you know, these culture wars and toxic fake news and all that stuff. We have to, that has to stop. That has to stop. And I think that will stop uh, if we are in our hearts and we've gone through something real and more serious, like the loss of dear friends just had a news that our dear uh, friend, she's in her 30s and she's very pregnant. She's six, two months out and she got it. They, they verified it. And just now she's started running really bad fever and they're rushing her to the hospital. And she's only in her mid 30s. And so they're concerned about, of course, the baby as well. Uh, so it, it's a lot of feeling. It's a lot there that maybe we're collectively feeling this 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 carrier of whatever it is coming through humanity. We're all, what time in our history were we all in the same heart space or a similar heart space like this? It's amazing, absolutely amazing. So perhaps, Sorry, I'm sorry that 10 people are. Next time we'll let everybody in sooner. But uh, just uh, concluding this little part, perhaps this is our great teacher of the world, in the year 2020, the year where we should get clearer vision for where we're going. This great teacher has arrived to humble us, to put us back into our hearts, to also give us a real glimpse as science may be discovering not only where we came from and how, and how improbable all that was, but the size of the universe itself and where we, we live in this magnificent thing called human beings, which when I was with Dennis McKenna in the Sacred Valley about five years ago, I had a conversation with a magnificent tree called a lacuma tree that was growing where we were doing our work. 
and I went out to her at night and it was a great moon, like a 50 year moon coming through the tree and its limbs were all in shadow. And I danced in those limbs. I danced the state of humanity in the limbs. I showed her the corporation, something like, something like a, an organism, but that, that was the main mechanism that was both powering us and consuming everything as you could understand. Uh, and I showed a lot of things through the dance. And then I turned to her and I asked her, do you mind that we're taking all the green? She said, I am the last of my kind. I am the last of these great Lakuma trees. I was planted by the pre-Incans 1100 years ago. She showed me how the planting happened. It was brown hands pushing her seed from the pit of the Lakuma into the soil and spitting on the soil. And that's how she came into being. She said, I am the last, but I want to tell you that you are the greatest creation of this life. You are the great wonder children, you are the great creation of all of this. You are, you are worth all of this. If you can somehow get through, make us a new home. So I think it's probably a, a good idea to open it up and I think people can just uh, so how, how was that I mean how was that everyone Is that a I just want to say I agree 100% uh, unmute all. <laughs> yeah thanks for sharing that Bruce that was really awesome. I completely agree, as it sounds like a lot of others do as well. Oh man, some of these people like this one so much. <laughs> Thank you for everyone. Uh, since this is a salon, I'll, uh, I think you can unmute yourself. Unmute everyone. Then uh, just feel free to to type in, to unmute and type in. Hey Bruce, it might be a little, yeah, you got it. Charles, yeah? Yeah, no, no, you, you did what I was gonna suggest, sorry. Okay, thank you. Well, that was beautiful, Bruce. Thank you for sharing that vision of an integrated earth system. Uh, um, and yeah, you're, Poetic, poetic as always, but um, a, be a beautiful vision and several models and maps of how to possibly start talking about how to engage with uh, this, you know, life OS as you talk about, um, which I'm sure you're gonna we're gonna continue to talk about here as in future topics. How so? There's an OS. How do we engage? Thanks, James. I am. Um like others here. I think a lot of what you said reinforced my work, a lot of the things that I'm thinking about all the time. And uh, the idea of this is the last of this specific you know, type of tree. I'm not entirely sure that that isn't a major part of my work. I never thought about it before, but I really think that that's something I got upon me. So thank you. You're welcome, Larry. I just wanted to um, keep going with the, the thought that James echoed uh, when you said uh, that it's a, an, an OS and <clears throat> he said, uh, how do we interact with it? And it struck me that um, 
one of the uh, things that we are learning a lot about these days is um, the spirit worlds and alternate realities and shamanic journeying and plant medicines and things and we can go and, and find other energies to work with and lot, many of us are finding other energies to work with and they bring such um, leaps of understanding to um, you know interacting with the the newest sphere with uh, with these energies that, that surround us as you as you described yeah thank you thank you for that mark Yeah, it seems like, Bruce, your personal uh, flavor of interacting with the OS is what you call realm bending, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe you could share a little bit about um, what you mean by that, and it could inspire others to think about their version of realm building and, and how they're going about interacting with the Earth system and their environment and themselves. Well, for example, uh, and John Turner will remember, because he was here on the day that I got the keys to this property here in Boulder Creek in 1998. And they were just about to move back to Montana. And at that time, uh, I had a vision for this property. And I really put it out strongly. I, I wanted to develop gardens and have flags hanging and decorations and decks and uh, beautiful little spaces and other little dwellings. And by golly, it has all happened. It has all happened because I held that dream and I held the property kind of in the cup of my hand in care and love that all of the resources and people and the right people would show up and it would create a, a magical place that I knew it could be. The bones were already there. And it just, by holding that attention, and waiting for actions to come, being a, having having a, an awareness of that and then taking the actions things just happen and even in this time uh, we can just kind of go quiet we could meditate do breath work do medicine work uh, do a walk in the mountains and ask for guidance ask for a vision that is very personal for, for oneself and then Maybe also a vision for the neighborhood. You know, what if the neighbors got along? What if our chickens could be, you know, the eggs could go to all the neighbors and we could create a better life on this, this hillside. Um, and a vision for humanity. If we all kind of said, you know, what is a vision for humanity in 2022 when this might have run its course, 2021 to 22? In, a softer, more heartfelt humanity, a more gentle, wise leadership around the world, perhaps, or even the current leaders humbled by what's happened, finally humbled. Maybe the, the energetic system of a corporation, the constant manufacturing slowed down, and people adjusted, they adjusted back down. Uh, is that a vision that we could hold? Because if we hold that as a dream and we really pay attention to it, I really believe that it's a focusing point on this, this thing called the field and the field starts to do it. It's like a server call, like a SQL query, like we're continually pinging the field like, because we really want this outcome and we're willing to do the work to make the outcome real. But we're asking the field to help us out because one individual or one government or one you know, a group of any kind, one company, can't do it. It's too big of a task. We can't get our heads around the complexity of this thing. No human being can can do that. Therefore, we have to have a more powerful tool to help us. And perhaps this thing is real, this field thing is real. Um, one of the things that I can give you, so, so the gearheads in the audience, you know, I talk about gearheads being wanting a physical explanation, reductionist explanation, and the Buddha heads are already in the know, right? They're already the observer. They're already connected universally, so they don't need explanations as much. But there's a way to unify the gearhead and Buddha head uh, modality or way of doing things. And that is looking at the cell itself looking at how amazing cells are and how they 
how they crowd everything together, how they squish everything together to increase the probability of things. The cell is an exquisitely designed probability shaping machine that crowds molecules in just the right way, attaches them to membranes so that they're moving around the membranes in a two-dimensional interface, coming into contact with a community of other molecules or in organelles in the case of our bodies or in localized concentration points or in the in the cups of en enzymes so this is what cells do and this is what life does it, it takes this jumble of things like if you had kittens running all over the fields like we have one running around the property gets them into one room full of cushions then they're going to do fun kitten things with each other and they're actually going to develop their intelligence and wreck a bunch of cu cushions in the process uh, but the crowding together is the fundamental unit of the driver of evolution and of life itself so as we crowd together again as a species not just in these zoom sessions but in intimate settings at home where we're less like gas molecules moving around we create a stronger uh, probability shaping machine. This is why in the healing arts now, we see that the patient with the client practitioner mode can only accelerate evolution in terms of healing or insights only at a certain rate. But as soon as you get a group together that is doing group work, group work with healing, with medicines, with prayer, with song, there's, there's basically much more power, much more than linear increase in the power of that the group to do things and to shape the probability of the likelihood of someone finding something that they deeply need to heal. And so the healing arts is now going toward the group. And Dalai Lama has said that future guru is not an individual, it's the community, it's the group, is the guru. And so he doesn't want any more Dalai Lamas. So that's a fundamental principle. And that as we were prosimians in the rainforest giants 90 million years ago, when we were, when we were this small, we were two inch bodies and whip tails. And we were in close balls, puddles, uh, as insectivores, you know, their, their lifestyle tends to be that way. And we ate uh, insects and big dragonflies. We chewed down a lot of carbohydrates and we craved sugar. So the burger fries and the, shape diet was our deepest ancestry but the power of those communities was in close physical contact at all you know for a lot of the time and even into the, the time of artipithecus and the time when africa split down the middle and you had the drying of east africa even then people were very close physically and something happened to us something happened to us in the last say 500 years across the West initially and other places where we started to separate physically. And of course, these days we're in automobiles and in separate seating at work. We don't sit together as groups. We don't have body-to-body -body contact. And I think in some ways for our health and in our the very shaping of how our dreams can be realized, we have to come back into close contact. The irony is it's a time of social distancing. But maybe it's a time to consider that when that time ends, that time of social distancing, what you are missing by not having the physical contact or even in being in the same room with people. Feel the sort of intensity of that because as we go farther and farther away from social contact, we're, we were actually going toward a social distancing world where everyone's just on their phone all the time and they don't even notice that there are bodies. You know, that's that's what we were tra we're training our young people to do is to privilege this screen instead of eye contact and so we learn through this experience the kind of, of, of pain of not having that human contact so that we value it more when we can come back together uh, outside of our isolation groups but perhaps there's some something there this is a long ramble, but I hope it's uh, valuable. Anyone feel free to, 
to take over the conversation in a new direction in the salon format. So augment what you're saying. Um, where we are now is in a bardo in between whatever the world was and whatever the world is going to be. And we each have agency to articulate the world that we want to see becoming. And so just as Bruce is calling upon us to call upon the field and to envision it, part of envisioning it is manifesting with specificity in whatever field of endeavor that you're working in, what you want the world that's coming to be. And we have this opportunity now. Uh, this is Gaia's gift. Uh, you know, many have articulated that. You know, it could have been much worse. It could have been happening in winter. It could have been, uh, you know, some kind of a climate disaster. But instead, it's stay at home in the spring and reorient yourself to my rhythms. Reorient yourself to each other. Experience what new life and new growth is and then go back out into each other and create the world as you wish to see it. So we need to articulate with specificity to those that listen to us, every single one of us, how we want that world to be because that kind of thought leadership is going to be persuasive. It's not just enough to imagine it, we need to articulate it and every single one of us has a group that we influence and so I think we should go out there and do that. Thank you, Charles. Hi, Bruce. Hey. Hi. I uh, I wanted to um, I wish to uh, share uh, your expressions of how you have within your own uh, community there on on the ancient Oaks Farms how you have um, modeled such a beautiful arrangement. So that although we are in social distancing at this time, we can within our immediate community be building um, the skill sets of, of deepening how we relate to each other and in, in, in that practice so that when the social distancing is uh, lifted and softened then we can carry those practices out and it reminded me of um, when you were expressing the the word you use the word disequilibria and the opportunity that we have right now to re-regulate within ourselves and then re-regulate how we're interacting with each other in our immediate household and then as uh, the openings uh, open and unfold and opportunities to to really acknowledge where that disequilibria is so that we can um, thoughtfully and intentionally shift it into a more regulatory so that's how i took that that in and put it together and threaded it and i just wanted to thank you for for sharing what you're doing in your community because i think it's a really beautiful model myself i'm spending a lot more time and i'm grateful for it um within my own home in deep connection and also tilling the ground with my hands and watching new seeds sprout and to be able to have the opportunity to slow down enough to do that i feel like that's gonna stay with us so that not only that we can see growth uh, from the seeds that we plant in nature uh, literally but also see that growth and that seeds um, blossom within our relationships so i just wanted to thank you thanks juliana i want to invite Catherine to He's got quite a vision for what we're going to do here on our land. Uh, this is all fresh and new. And, uh, and I want to invite her to, to share some of that. Uh, talk about putting me on the spot. <laughs> what do you want to, what do you want to talk about? Yeah. How, how are we going to make a new way to live, to consume the products we need uh, to give art for each other, to give each other health, like you're doing for me right now. You mean like in a dyad or in the larger community? In, in the larger community. In the larger community. Yeah. yeah um, uh, I haven't, I'm not really prepared for this. We've been dreaming and imagining um, 
the future here. And, and as Bruce said, we've all we've been sort of thrown together uh, and it's a pretty accelerated, amplified time for us. And, and it's a process of, um, you know, analyzing and surrendering and, <laughs> and analyzing and surrendering to what seems to want to be. And uh, I feel really called to this property and to help Bruce take it to the next level. He's got so much beautiful infrastructure here and he's built this wonderful Gandalf house that we're uh, furnishing and fleshing out the inside. And, um, and so sort of the bigger vision for the property is to be a place where people can come and when they get out of their car, or step through the gate, that their systems feel nourished, that this is a place that really is geared towards the latest science, um, the latest sort of spirituality about how humans thrive. What, what, what is, you know, what the optimal sort of nutrition and the optimal uh, embodiment practices and um, the best way to have sex, right? Like, um, not that we're doing that here publicly or anything, but just like all these sort of subjects are up for how we love each other in embodiment. And then, you know, intellectually waking up and um, thinking about uh, some of the optimal ways to do that, whether it's meditation or plant medicine or extreme sports or whatever it is to get us into that flow state so we can collectively dream. And then just more connection. Everything here um, we want to gear towards, you know, small areas on the property where there's an opportunity to come together and bathe, or there's an opportunity to come together and meditate or to dance. We'll have different spaces around the property. It's already sort of the infrastructure is here. And so we're hoping that, um, you know, we can nourish the community um, with this space. And um, so this is sort of, these are the things that we're up to during the shelter in place, having these sort of discussions and dreams for the future. And what we would extend to all of you when the shelter in place is lifted is uh, to pay us a visit. Uh, people have been coming here for 22 years for various events, and Liana has been a, to a couple of them. Uh, and I give you tours of the DigiBarn, which is the history of computing in the last hundred years. We also have Timothy Leary's extant library and uh, Timothy uh, Terence McKenna is actually some of his last papers. Uh, so I'm I'm an aficionado, a passionate, obsessive person about this these histories. But we also have gardens. Uh, we have a kind of now emerging, uh, along with the very nerdy farm, we have a, a bus called No Further that you can sleep in. We have uh, now this Gandalf theme because I'm I was in New Zealand two years ago and they declared me to I went to Weta workshop that made the uh, Lord of the Rings film and the uh, the owner of Weta declared me to be Gandalf the graying you know the uh, young more colorful Gandalf but it's getting gray uh, and they uh, they've been helping us with design ideas for for it so consider this kind of like a a shire, maybe an elven, wizardly type shire, but the occasional hobbit. A uh, place of magic. Uh, so, so why we love the Lord of the Rings so much was that every place that uh, the characters went through, that the fellowship went through, had it, its superpower of, of magic. You know, when they went to the shire, they went into the dark woods and they were at uh, Tom Bombadil's cabin. That wasn't shown in the film. But then they went to the human worlds, the elvish worlds, Rivendell. They went to these lands that were considered magic and alive. And everyone built structures to really give the power of their culture and their vision and their energy and their spiritual beliefs. It's why when, when we go to a place like uh, Lhasa or a place like the Sacred Valley and to the Incan environments, we feel that power. And I think perhaps uh, each of us uh, burners, you know, we know we can create the playa anywhere, really, in one room. You can create the vibe of the playa. And maybe we can rethink not just the way we interact, but how we live, how we dress, what we eat, how we entertain each other. We can bring back some of that magic that, that we so love in our fiction and in our film. We so love, I, I don't want to live in the 
Game of Thrones world, but you know, I'll choose another one. Some people might. Uh, hot Harry Potter worlds and things like this. And what we're discovering actually, you know, in my realm bend bending practice, I never thought it was anything other than an overactive, wonderful imagination. But when, as it started to, to bring miracles into existence, like the, the after 42 years, having one night, the, the download vision of how life began, you know, in full detail, the full endogenous cycling system I was thrown into for 45 minutes that led to this understanding and, and science testing it out just in New Zealand making protocells in hot springs. Uh, I'm a believer, so I'm, I'm a believer in a real form of magic called intention and attention and action. And it's the shaping of, of the field in front of us. And visionary downloads can, can be a powerful part of that. I think in the past, it was called the power of prayer, or perhaps there was uh, all kinds of magic arts related to this. The people put an intention into the future and then something came and they were considered sort of magical beings. And unless they had the, the right calculation tables and they could predict eclipses. And that's what they only, they are the only ones that knew that. Uh, sort of the tricksters, but for the true magic, the true shaping of probability itself, we're on that verge. And perhaps the pandemic is going to slow us down enough because we can't do it when we're busy. Uh, there's one, I forget who said it, that the only way to make a spiritual uh, move or some kind of fundamental discovery is to slow down. Slow down and listen, listen to the body and the environment and pay attention. And you can't do any of that if we're going so fast. So like this, this happenstance or action of Gaia or natural result of the disequilibria in the field, we're suddenly slowed down. Human civilization has had the brakes put on it, slows down like it's moving into jello. And it gives us that opportunity again to do the real magic, the true magic which is to connect in the quietude into the power of what is, of our emergence, of the top of the silver spire, of our improbability, of this field, of we could call it, some would call it God, contact with God. All these things that slow us down and we have, we feel it and we get a glimpse of it and we say, hey, guess what? We were losing this. We were losing this. When I, when I lived in Prague, uh, in the early 90s, Václav Havel, who was the philosopher president of the country, came on the radio at the time, the annual address from Lani, and he said, I have to tell you people something. We have gained freedoms. Communism is now three years in the past. All that kind of thing that, that kept us down for 38 years, but something has been lost, and it's been lost quickly. The hectic has come for us. We call it the hectic. And what he was meaning, and actually he explained what he, what he meant, which was, did you know that I was under arrest for 13 years in, in house arrest? He was in prison for part of his incarceration time, and then he was in house arrest. So in that 13 years, these four or five people would come over every Sunday. We would smoke and drink and talk about literature, play instruments, and that I have not seen any of these people socially in two years. This is what has happened. So this was Václav Havel in 1994. So we really have lost something. And some of us, when we go out to Burning Man, we find it. When we go into nature, we find it. When we do a retreat, we find it. But perhaps it's not enough. Perhaps the whole civilization needs to slow down and refine this, this connection, this power. And that the field is so much more powerful now than it was 500 years ago. There's so much more interconnection. I mean, cell phones have densified the field. Everything densifies it. That as we slow down, the power of that field, the power of our connection, the energy that we're given, the guidance, the visions, the downloads, the healing potential, the seeing potential is so much more than it was 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 300 years ago. It is so intensified. 
if we only we only recognize that it is there and we ask it for help. Well, that's a, another set of, of thoughts that just come out. As uh, someone who practices Chinese medicine, I will say that I think that the winter every year asks us to slow down and listen. And that's a very integral part of um, the ancient texts is staying in alignment with the seasons. And that's something that our modern culture refuses to do. And, you know, people talk about flu season getting worse all the time. And obviously this year we have this new virus that's exponentially worse maybe than flus we've seen in our lifetimes. But it really looks a lot like to me that we didn't rest. We didn't go in. We didn't have the insights. We didn't listen. And we spent winter acting as though it was summer. Mm. And now we're wondering why we can't maintain good health in the spring. And it's, you know, this is, these are the consequences of this kind of pretense. Beautifully said, David. We have four, four new people who have joined. But feel free to unmute and uh, say a few words about what you're feeling about this time and any insights you might have might like to share. I want to offer um, my perspective on connection um, and how my thoughts on it have changed due to the shelter in place I'm in San Francisco. So as somebody who lives alone, um, webinars like this and video chatting are, are pretty much it for me right now. Um, and as an introvert, I do really appreciate that because I think, you know, acknowledging the importance of in-person community um, and like my newfound appreciation for it. I also have an appreciation or I also see the need for more meaningful ways to connect um, online as well. You know, as opposed to just texting or scrolling through social media, I think focused events like this where a group that has a shared purpose or a shared vision or whatever you want to call it spaces like like virtual spaces like this where we can come together um like i find that to be a very meaningful way to connect as well so i, I kind of see it as like both like we of course i think that it's clear we need a little bit more local resilience um, but there is also a lot of power to like global connectivity um, so I've been feeling really. Thank you, Shenshin. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It certainly, it seems like, like digital spaces can be intimate too, which is also a lesson. Tying it back to lacuna trees and Lord of the Rings, I think about the Ents who are basically saying, you know, you are hasty folk. You need to slow down. You're very, very hasty folk. And I don't know. I gotta think about that some more. Can I add to what Shen Shen was saying about community? And as Bruce was talking, um, the connectivity of the planet, I sort of see us as being points of light, but I do, where we may not need teachers, like it's for us to connect directly to God. What really helps is to have some focus. So like right now, all of us, our attention, our intention, you know, is being unified. And so that unification, I think, also concentrates the energy to accomplish what the visions are. Yeah, completely agree. That that seems to be the principle. And and uh, if you look at 
For several million years of our history, our species was in small family groups, travel groups, and often they were moving. So even from the time when we were still in the rainforest six million years ago, uh, to the time of the drying out of East Africa and then drying out and colonization of South Africa by modern humans who then radiated back north. These, we are always in groups traveling. And sometimes when we see sort of a TV show or documentary which shows a family, you know, wizened elders, children, mothers carrying babies, young ones, walking over a mountain pass. When I see that, there's something goes out in my heart for them because something like, may they make it, may they be blessed, they find their way because obviously they're moving their community. And this happened trillions of times. This happened endlessly for our ancestors in all groups, in all cultures. And we go, our heart goes out to them, may they find that next valley because we know intimately they are us and uh, we're now as a planetary family climbing over that ridge and wondering what's on the other side and perhaps that's a story we can we can tell ourselves a little bit more but that we are moving as, as a unit in groups like this and we're trying to find that safe passage through the mountains uh, for our next sustenance. That's been our driver for as long as humans and proto-humans were around. That was the driver. And we could only do it mostly in community, climbing those mountain passes, crossing the deserts to the next river system, you know, paddling in, in boats between islands. We didn't do it often as individuals. That, that was a high risk activity. We did it in community. So it's a prerogative of humans. So say perhaps what might happen to us if we lose 50% of our population uh, due, due to these, these, these viruses or due to other conditions, well, we may be starting on the move again. Uh, we may have to go to new homes by mid to end of century, but it's something that humans are good at. They're good at banding together. They're good at surviving arduous circumstance. You know, we may think that we've become soft, but um, when there was the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake here in 1989, I remember uh, up at the Nimitz Expressway, right through Oakland there, it had collapsed. The upper deck had come down from all these vehicles and everyone showed up. Everyone in the East Bay and in Oakland went down there. They didn't run away, they went there. People with jackhammers, people with medical, and everyone just showed up, whether they were homeless people or people in fancy lofts or whatever, they all came to try to help pull people out, see if there's anyone who made it through. That was a community in action. And you see that over and over again across cultures. So in a sense, perhaps we shouldn't be afraid of this thing because we are incredible survivors. I think there's nothing Nothing that's going to wipe out all of humans, save the impact of a large asteroid, for example, a mega event. We're gonna be here for thousands of years. We're gonna we're gonna have time to grow up and wise up and get up and lighten up. You know, we're 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 gonna be able to do this. And we've been through a period in the last hundred and fifty years of acceleration like this beyond what any any animals ever experience. When you when you think about it, here we are where for entire part of our history, an entire ninety million years of prosimian evolution, we traveled by foot. And then suddenly in the, the span of a century, we're traveling into space in automobiles and jet aircraft, and it's all normal to us. You know, we started out in trains in the 19th century. In the 19th century, if you look at reports of in the 1830s and 40s of talking about it is impossible for the human body to survive speeds more than 30 miles per hour, this is sort of in the English press. But 10 years later, when there was a railway network across Britain built by 
Stevenson and Burnell, uh, somebody stood up in Parliament talking about a ma it is a national crime that trains coming into Birmingham or Paddington Station or whatever it was had to switch between the wide gauge of the, the, Bur the Burnell Railway to the narrow gauge of the Stevenson and it causes 15 minute delays uh, in getting onto the train going forward and that they should standardize the gauge. This was just a decade after this idea that we couldn't travel fast. People are cooling their heels and looking at their watches or their pocket watches and complaining about a 15 minute delay on a trip that used to take three days and you'd get robbed by, robbed by high wind. You know, in the past, it's now going to take two hours down to London, up to London. And so humans be, seem to have this ability to adjust so well to the accelerations of culture, new ideas. We, we now have 10,000 stories in our heads instead of just four or five that our ancestors might have had. We're extraordinarily adaptive. And I just have no doubt that we will, we will survive the stresses that are pushing down on that silver spire after our awakening up and before our, our complete opening or complete wise merger with the field. Somewhere up here, we're going to be stressed and stressed and stressed again. We're going to respond and we're going to push through and we're going to become more humane as a civilization, more wise, better manage our planet, because these forces are going to push us toward doing that. And we're going to move toward life. We're going to move toward you know, sustainability. We're going to move toward care for other humans. Because we have been for the last several hundred years. We've been moving in that direction distinctly away from previous modes of behavior that we've had. So we're, going to, we're pushed forward. But, you know, it's painful. It's, uh, there's casualties. And... In evolution, there always are. You know, in evolution, there are always that deer population that crashes or species that don't get through. I think we're, we're the species that now we have the responsibility that we are running evolution on this planet. We, there's so little wild biomass left. It's all in the service of humans. All of our cities and our pets and animals and everything we farm so we are in charge of evolution on the earth at this point. And we're waking up to that responsibility and that uh, even to the extent that perhaps through our actions, we brought this, this virus into being. We created the opportunity for it. We are responsible for that. It's not something coming from the outside. We were responsible in, in our actions. And we're going to now be able to use data and reporting and sharing to say, hey, wow, this is what we did right and this is what we did wrong. And we're going to learn for the next uh, pandemic that will come. And it will come in a shorter period of time than the previous ones. So it's, you know, I just have great faith and a lot of sense of, there's a lot of history to back up the fact that we are going to make it through this thing. Um, but it will certainly help having a positive attitude about it, a constructive, hopeful attitude. Because if you lose hope and you stop breathing, and you go to short breath, you become, you become a casualty in a sense. Um, keeping, keeping breathing, keeping hoping, keeping helping, uh, keeping expressing, being, ex existing every day is the thing that will build that power. We're going to be here in 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. Ruth. Um, go ahead. Hi, Ruth. This is Catherine Bird. Good to see you. So uh, lovely to hear your very grounded, positive message and um i think that what i what i'm seeing i mean it just feels in a lot of ways like a great inspiration and i mean the whole situation feels very inspirational and in a beautiful opportunity for us to come together and to reflect both individually and collectively 
towards our transformation and our evolution and our growth. And um, it, it's echoing a lot of information that has been coming through, through spiritual channels um, and in with the people that I work with and support and the information that I'm receiving and they're receiving. And uh, it seems to be really in alignment with a lot of that information and um, been getting a lot of uh, information around, uh, I think you called it the probability, but it's been like the possibility field. Mm -hmm. And tapping into that possibility field and really being able to uh, feel it, witness it, uh, feel the energetic grid that we're all working on. And it, it has been said a couple of times, um, I think uh, Shen Chen was talking about the, the um, you know, our online communities and I've been inspired to be hosting uh, support calls every week. And uh, you know, then I have other group calls and just to be able to witness all of these people from all over the world in these different places, all at the same time coming together for prayer and intention and visioning and moving the energy that, that does feel dense you know, for ourselves, but then for the collective to be of service in that way all around the world at the same time, holding that connect, that intention and, and connecting into this, you know, po probability and possibility that we're, we've been doing this solo work for ourselves mm -hmm. uh, for so long, you know, coming together for ourselves, meditating and praying and doing our healing work and finding out who we are and going through our own personal dark nights of the soul. And then here we are as a collective going through that same process and, each one of us getting to be a part of, of anchoring in, as you're saying, this new, this new possibility that we have access to. So thanks for, for bringing it and, and bringing it in and the scientific and the spiritual and merging those in the way that you do so well. So thank you, Bruce, so good to see you. Thanks, Kat, thank you very much. Hey, this is Martina, can you hear me? I just uh, I hopped on later in the call. Um, hi, Bruce. Hi, Catherine. We talked today. Hi, Catherine. So cool. Um, yeah, there's just a lot going on in regards to, to this virus. But what I really feel in my heart is that if I mean, I'm end, end, end of my 40s. So I feel like because we've lived in such accelerated time i've lived in so many different places i've been to so many different places i've experienced so many different things so in a way i'm older you know in years than than maybe someone who lived the same age to the same age about a hundred years ago so if i have to let go and surrender my life at this point i feel like i have lived a very full very rich life with a lot of experiences beautiful relationships, um, different incarnations and chapters in my life. I feel so rich and enriched by all the things that have happened that if I have to make room for the young generation to, to make this shift happen, you know, like I really believe that we have these rainbow children and crystal children all over the world with these new minds, these new brains, synapses firing in ways that I don't even fathom how, they, how they're doing it. You know, they're coming downloaded with so much beauty and so much resilience and so much brilliance that um, if, if, if a part of us, this global community has to let go of our lives to give room for this new, fresh, young start, I'd be okay with that. You know, I'm okay with letting go of my life. At the same time, I want to fight and I want to be there when it all happens. You know, I, I want to be part of seeding that. I want to be one of the ancestors, one of the wise elders that can hold some of the hands of the young ones as they're coming up and brainstorming beautiful new ways to, to, to revive our planet and, and have energies sourced from places we have not even thought about, you know. So I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm ready either way, you know, if the pandemic is going on strong and, and I'm not meant to make it, I'm okay with that, you know, there's some, I don't know, even though I'm still young, you know, it feels like there's some sense of reflection that has gone on over these last <laughs> 10, mm -hmm. 15 days of self-quarantining where I'm like, you know, I've done this, I've been there, I've 
um, there's definitely things I still would love to do and I'm sure I will get to do them but it's deep in my heart and deep in my soul I'm ready to have our uh, um, global footprint shrink a little bit so that we can start fresh if I'm part of that I'd love it and if I'm not so be it you know <laughs> there's a world after this that's going to be amazing and awesome as well uh -ho. <laughs> oh there's a a beautiful YouTube video I saw a few months ago with a, a holy man, a sadhu, walking along the Ganges. And the Ganges was just full of trash, absolutely full of trash and mounds of trash and bottles and things like this. And he turned sort of and put his hands out. And he said, all of this because we have too many desires. If we just cut back the things that we desire or the objects we want, or the experiences we want and just reduce what we want and maybe said we have enough where can we get down to where we have enough then all of this all of this waste and trash would be reduced and i think it was a really simple uh, telling of what martina has just sort of brought to us which just uh lower it's not even lowering expectation it's asking what is actually enough for a good and nourished life? I think it's an excellent question. If, if I may, in a, in a way, like frame this, what I'm, what I'm hearing come out is, is um, a lot of the sharing so far on kind of the um, like, um, recognition of the issues and also the kind of metaphysical framework to even recognize that this ridge that we could be navigating to get to the other side exists. Um, so th there's this kind of question of how, how do we, you know, get a clear view of the ridge, like realize the ridge is there, help other people realize that the ridge is there and needs to be surmounted. Um, and then there's kind of a question of how do we then navigate that ridge um, individually and collectively. Um, some people have shared some specific, like more concrete things that they're doing. Um, and then there's kind of a question of what, what might be on the other side and what might that future look like. There seem like broad categories of kind of um, things to point at or questions to answer that, that I'm hearing come out. And yeah, I invite anyone to point at, kind of put, share anything under any of those three. It seems to kind of a breakdown of framing if you will. And by the way, we're past two hours uh, on the meeting. And any of those who feel like they need to drop out, please, please do. Um, we'll continue probably for another, I'd say half hour, 45 minutes here. Uh, and I'm seeing people on the second screen here who are wonderfully comfortable looking there and you're most welcome to, uh, to pipe in at any time. If no one else, because <clears throat> yeah, I already went, so if anybody wants to go to respond to what James was saying, I'm, I'm thinking of this a lot as the time between infections. So that is to say 1990, 1919 to 2020 was this massive growth spurt for the monkey. And one of the ways I'm thinking about this that I think is helpful is uh, just as you go through this massive growth spurt in puberty that settles down when you're an adult, that's what this was. We have grown. We have grown enough. We have given birth to the third intelligence if the first was Gaia and the second is animals and the third is the medium upon which we're speaking. Now we have the opportunity to slow down and absorb what we have because we have everything you need, we need, and we can keep it, but we can't take anymore. So puberty as a metaphor for the 20th century, I think is a fairly useful one uh, in terms of thinking about how we're going to traverse the 21st and 22nd. Thank you. Well, I, I'd just like to say uh, this very interesting discussion. And, and as we've talked about how we're, we're moving through this this bottleneck, maybe to some new new paradigm, but 
something bothers me a little bit about this, which is the fact that you know, and, and I, I have this problem too with the psychedelic community. I wonder sometimes if we're so into our community that we never look beyond it. You know, the very fact that we're on this call means that we're a privileged group, you know, in a certain sense. We, we all have computers, we all have access to the internet. We could have these dialogues, we could speculate about, you know, the next evolutionary step and the changing paradigm that we are undoubtedly going through. 90% of the world is not in that conversation, you know, and yet 90% of the world, the whole world is suffering from the consequences of our unsustainable practice, which has led to, you know, this coronavirus, which is you know, relatively low impact, but is it a, is it a warning sign for what's to come? You know, and we uh, often speculate, what is the end of the world going to look like? You know, hopefully it'll never end, but clearly it goes through changes. Is it going to be an asteroid? Is it going to be nuclear war? Is it going to be some kind of environmental disaster? All of these things are happening. And in some ways the, this virus is, I mean, it, it, it's a manifestation of Gaia's kindness in a certain way, you know, because this is, the virus itself is not that, not that impactful. What it's impacting is our economic and governmental and political and all of these situations, which we know are unsustainable. And yet, you know, they're sustaining us. I'm just wondering, you know, in this community, most of us are, you know, uh, tied together through an interest in the psychedelic experience for one thing, but we tend to be a, a compassionate community, but also self-centered. You know, how do we extend this compassion to the rest of the world? How do we bring the rest of the world into this conversation? You know, to the, you know, to the family in China that's impacted by this, to, you know, by to people that don't really have any economic resources, and for whom this coronavirus, as as benign as it is when it comes to viruses, it's already a tremendous, uh, you know, it's a tremendous challenge to them. It's a life-threatening challenge. You know, as I think about how the world has to transform itself, I think, you know, the, the dark thought is that basically there are so many people in the world that all the systems are stretched to the limit. How are we going to get past that without basically some kind of mass extinction event? And, and I'm just putting it out there, and I know that that's a downer, but I think we have to talk about it or at least think about it. So that's my two cents for now. I don't think there has to be a mass extinction, but there definitely might be a pruning happening. And that might be, it might be a natural, you know, the planet, I, since I, the day I was born, I've always said that the world won't end, the planet won't end. So if you think about realms, you know, world being world of man, Yes, that's undergoing a, an extreme change, but the planet we live on that we are a part of is changing with us. And there is a complete imbalance in my humble opinion. And man is sort of a scourge on the planet. So it makes perfect sense to me that we would be being somewhat pruned and rejected. And that's okay with me. Yeah. I I, I agree with you. I think, you know, I, I think there may be a, I think there may be more than a pruning, you know, uh, pruning doesn't really, well, I mean, it's a, it's a place to start, but I, I just wonder, um, you know, is, is there a way to get through this that doesn't involve the, the death of hundreds of millions of people? And I'm not sure, you know, you, you look at, 
I mean, I totally agree with you. The planet will persist and, and life on this planet will persist. It's incredibly resilient. And actually, in that sense, I, I appreciate Bruce's comments that, you know, humans are incredibly adaptable and tough. You know, some will survive. The problem is many will not. And it won't be this pandemic. It may be the next one or the next whatever event it is. So in that sense, the 21st century, it looks uh, pretty grim. If, if this is the transitional century, maybe at the end of it, it'll look much better, but, but it's, it's gonna be a tough time, I think. Hopefully the clearing of the skies, I think a lot of people might slow down, might have a better sense of their body now. Everybody's out walking. I, I've never seen couples out walking dogs. Usually it's one. There's so much change going on in people that really I think we could reach homeostasis. It doesn't have to be like a downward curve to oblivion. We could sort of like slow down and and balance things out and everybody not consume as much and people be more planet friendly and travel less and be more mindful and things could just get better and better and better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sometimes it seems to me is that we have um, just um, a challenge in that the, 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 the capitalist tendencies of certainly our country and many countries around the world um, are to you know consume and to grow and to take resources and we've realized it for a long time and many people have complained about how it can be countered, but it, it seems at this point that we're, you know, we're fighting ourselves a little bit in that regard. Um, we certainly have the resources to make the planet, you know, beautiful, but if we had the will and the organization, you know, that was, that's what's lacking. So it seems that um, one step that we could take maybe is to learn how, and, and I've seen a lot of people talking about this already, is like, learn how to take this as a lesson that can at least make a little bit of momentum in that direction, right? And those Stacy was saying, and others have said, learn how this, you know, use this virus to indicate what can happen to the planet without us, and to maybe come, you know, to a place where a lot of people are saying, well, we want to get back to normal. Like, well, uh, normal was not so good for a lot of reasons. Can we find a new normal that's a little closer to harmonious living and and, and positive impact on the planet, and, and understand our role within the natural cycles of things? Maybe this is an opportunity in that regard. Question. Um, <clears throat> Dennis, Bruce, uh, Catherine, Nick, others have, it's a good observation Dennis made that the psychedelic community is somewhat insular. Um, Dennis, Bruce, you have seen people all over the world in your work. What is your prescription to groups like ours about how to be less insular and how to advance um, the partnerships and learning uh, for positive change because we need to listen more intelligently as well as speak more intelligently. What would you advise us on this call to be doing? Uh, I, for one, one thing that could happen, maybe as a suggestion, is if you uh, have a relative or a friend or acquaintance somewhere else in the world or even in your own town that doesn't hold the same uh, political views or worldview as you, what about a soft engagement in just regular interaction over the internet to tell each other stories, to search around for commonality? Because if, if anything, uh, what happens in our society is politicians, the media, people who are taking advantage, uh, try to put wedges between groups, try to tell us who we are and set groups against other groups. It's an old trick to gain, <clears throat> to gain power. It's one of the old tricks in the book. And it's been going on a lot the last 25 years or so. But what if people said, you know what? Just for now, we're gonna say, we are not, I'm not a red state person. I'm not a blue state person. I'm a human being. And I really like Uncle Harry. And I'm gonna call him up. I'm gonna ring him up through the internet and we're gonna just, talk more than we ever have talked across so-called divides. And if we all kind of did that, 
whether we're in the psychedelic community or the golfing community or the, you know, we're believers in a certain worldview, just reach out for change, reach out for novelty, reach out to tell stories and show, try to find commonality. Because what would happen in the old days of humans moving through communities? So for example, there was a type of person in Europe that would travel between villages for this is over about a 1200 year history. And there were, there were some in some cultures called soothsayers um, or storytellers or bards. And they would move between community and they would come to the edge of the community and they would uh, make a simple greeting. And then they would sit down with the people and they would share a couple of stories and try to seek commonality. And the soothsayer's job actually was to bring fresh new things into what could be a sort of stagnant family village. And even in some opportunities, uh, serve as the outside party to mediate disputes. Uh, and this was extremely common. It was part of the most powerful social web in, uh, from the Upper Paleolithic all the way into medieval Europe before cities got big. Uh, and so, in a sense, if we can kind of go back to that prerogative of finding common ground, even just that we both care about golf a lot, and talking to people that, for whatever reason, we felt a wall has been set up between us. And if we can do that, we can actually reverse a lot of the damage that's been done by all the rhetoric and all the ideology and all of the so-called culture wars, which we may find out aren't real at all. And then we can take back our communities, we can take back our everything, politics, sharing, our families. Um, we can start to love each other again. And really, it's going to come down to that. If we love one another and love our neighbors and we love people across the world and we're sharing them goodwill, the world will go in a good direction. Yes, it always comes down to that, doesn't it? You know, in, in order to love, you have to step outside yourself. And uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe that's part of the lesson is that this is just the beginning and things may have to get much, much worse. But at some point, we'll reach a point where we recognize the commonality of our experience. You know, right now there's still, we live in a society of divisions and privilege and not privilege, the haves and the have-nots and so on, but we reach a point where everybody is equally threatened, then we have a motivation to come together. So, you know, I mean, Charles' question is a legitimate question. God knows I don't have the answers, but I think collectively as a community, we have to we have to think carefully about what those answers might be, and then you know try to share that wisdom. And and there are some among us who are thought of as thought leaders, and I would say Bruce, you're one of them. I guess I'm one of them. You know, but sometimes I feel like, boy, I, I'm out of my depth. I don't know what is going on. You know, I can ask questions and not, you know, so I don't, I mean, you can have a collective, you know, body of wisdom and you can have soothsayers, truthsayers, all of that. That's good. But the, uh, you know, as a species, we have to internalize this and become our own truthsayers in some way. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that means anything or if that's just more blather. <laughs> so. I'd like to add something to the equation. Uh, as someone who does a, uh, a public radio show every week, I talk to the public, and, and it, uh, believe me, the last few weeks is nothing but this topic. Uh, what people are interested in, if you want to talk to the larger community, or how can you stay maximally healthy? Uh, what about vitamins? You know, what? Well, how do you strengthen the immune system? Those are big questions right now. Um, there are people also from the DIY movement, the Maker's Fair, who've been calling in, and they're talking about DIY ventilators. And how can we make our own ventilators? 
uh, given the fact that we need 30,000 in New York State alone, and they have a thousand. You know, that's a lot of people dying. You know, so that's what people are concerned about right now. Um, and on a, on a uh, psychedelic level, I'm, I'm kind of curious if any of you have ever spoken to any psychics who are in the psychedelic state of uh, actually speaking to viral intelligence. I mean, is it possible that we can actually talk to the viral intelligences and negotiate a better deal with them? You know, is, is that level even possible? I do know folks attempting to speak with the virus using DMT as a tool. I don't know any results, but I will update. That would be really interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, I'll share an article. It is really fascinating, don't you think, that, that the simplest life form on the planet gives the most advanced life form, takes them to, to us, takes us to our knees? Isn't that strange? I and mean, what, what's the guy in telling us? And should we listen? And if so, what is she telling us? Oh, interesting. If I may, interestingly, like like what you what you just said, and and pointing back at what Dennis mentioned originally and then repeated um, about this, um, the most compelling thing about this virus and why Bruce way back mentioned that this is kind of like the bio, the built-in biological like waste management system of the of, of the Gaia OS or something, um, you know, because it it doesn't care. Um, of your status and it doesn't and it and, it, and it's it brings um the haves and the have-nots are equally con equally contagious and equally susceptible to this and and a lot of the um, different contexts that allow um, different privileged contexts that allow groups maybe like most of the people here um like you know if you're in new york right now you don't necessarily have any more access to uh, good medical care than someone in haiti where it doesn't have a hospital all right so this this is a leveler uh, the virus is as as this uh, this this leveler and this equal opportunity killer, right? It, and I think that crises, at least how I've been thinking about it, I mean, crises like this illuminate and like point bright spotlight at fragility in systems, your values, what really matters to you, uh, and um, so a lot of what we've been talking about is the individual kind of spiritual or metaphysical kind of. What are the implications of reevaluating what matters to you and what you care about in the face of this crisis? Um, and then, like you said, DIY ventilators and um, all of these amazing, um, like spontaneous volunteer projects and things, people are, are going out of their way to, to make things happen. Yes. It, about, it, it reveals a lot of fragility in the systems that we've built and it inspires a lot of direct action and inspirational action um, by, by people to, to kind of um, do these kind of uh, DIY projects and, and spin up companies and spin up uh, nonprofits and, and do this kind of thing. And that's, that's how, how I've been thinking about it at least. So the, the virus, the fact that it can bring us everyone to our knees, no matter if you're, um, no, no matter where you live and, and how old you are and, and whatever it is, seems like it's, it's feature, um, it's, it's killer feature. Well, it is. Liliana. And at the same time, you're at a true renaissance right now. I mean, we, we have the biohacker collective are creating vaccines in the bio community here, the, the hacker community. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of brilliant people that aren't in the system per se that are coming up with solutions. The idea of uh, also of the ventilators, they don't have to be modern ones. What, what the governments are doing is just buying the new ones that cost, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars each. The ventilators have been around since World War II. We just need them. We just need to find maybe Maybe there's a government warehouse with thousands of old ventilators sitting around somewhere. If you can find the right intelligence to access that, that would save a lot of lives right now. Yeah, and we have 3D printers uh, for the new ones, right, in the DIY system. So, yeah. so people are looking to be, uh, they have a lot of skill sets, a lot of uh, talent, and they, they're just looking at where, it, where should that talent be focused right now? And, and what, what should we create? Um, and that's what I'm finding, uh, as well as staying healthy, staying healthy, and how to do that. So I have uh, Dr. Dan Bieland visiting me right now, who's been uh, an expert in, in uh, the immune system and what to do to strengthen your immune system right now. He's been a regular on the show lately as well. I don't know if all of you are taking your vitamin D, A, and C, and I don't know if you know about uh, Dr. Shiva from uh, MIT, mm -hmm. who's written a letter to Trump categorizing our uh, four categories of people and how to handle them with vitamin A, D, and intravenous C, which has proven 
efficacious to this virus. Yeah. So uh, there's there's a lot of good things coming out of this very stressful period, and I think that you know we need to have a lot more realization that man man is a, an adaptable uh, intelligence that has we have a lot more intelligence than we're using, and we have access to a lot more than we're uh, able to comprehend at this particular moment. But things are going to be happening in a positive way. Uh, it, that's, that's just the natural stimulus response of our of our higher cortical function. Yeah. And why think of them? Why think of it as a yeah. medical system? Why not think of the viruses as something we can communicate with? And it's new paradigms of thought um, that could come through thought leaders. Well, as a, as a microbe evangelist, I have to pipe in just a little bit here. There's a lot of intelligence in um, uh, some of the fermented foods that we've evolved with and forgot about for 150 years and are starting to make a comeback. And, and um, there's a lot of intelligence in communities of microorganisms in things like sauerkraut and kombucha. And, and um, there is sort of a an interesting correlation there and there also seems to be um, some some information coming out of Korea I don't know how accurate it is I'm doing some research right now that lactic acid bacteria found in kimchi and sauerkraut um, seem to help the body produce more immunoglobin A which in turn helps the body produce more inferring gamma which are super duper immune boosters and they seem to be having lower mortality rates in Korea so there's something there I'm not um, I'm not, there's not enough correlation to um, present causation um, in either either direction, but it's still really interesting. And um, there are, I think, some intelligent food choices that we can be making to help strengthen our communities of microorganisms in our bodies. Right, the microbiome, yeah. Yes. Uh, if, if there's, a, unless there's someone else uh, dying to make a, pipe in here. Uh, we're getting closer to nine o'clock uh, California time and uh, I'd like to conclude with some some thoughts unless there's someone else who wanted to make another point. I had some thoughts I wanted to share. That's right. um, so it's a little poetic so if you'll bear with me. Um, I was thinking about how in the vision that you had Bruce where we're all like coming out of the mycelial mass like we're all extensions of the mycelium mass, essentially. Um, I think there's definitely power to that metaphor uh, because I learned a few weeks ago that mother trees can, through the mycelial network, send nutrients to their like daughter or children trees. Um, and I think that's very powerful because one, um, the world I think has a imbalance of archetypal male versus archetypal feminine energy. And I think that the feminine energy needs to be brought forward. Um, and part of that is like collaboration. It is, you know, having the microbiome, it is the collective. So in some ways I feel like it is kind of a call to be more nurturing and to think more collectively rather than individually or competitively, which is the more archetypal male energy. Um, and I think that it's also the opportunity um, to, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Um, You're, uh, it's time to bring the feminine energy more into focus, was where you were, I think? Yes. Um, or to balance male and feminine? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get it back. Um, but Community was, and nature? Community and nature, um, and I think, man, I'm, I'm not going to be able to get it back. I should have written it down. Um, something better than a competitive model. Some other new model of thinking about this. Thing. Yeah. yeah, like, oh, um, so I think, man, it's like right there, but I'm not going to be able to get it right now. Um, but thank you, you so much. I have to go decentralize intelligence. <laughs> um, no, it's not there. But if I do think of it, I'll try to mess it, like send it out, because it was like it was like a thread. I had like you know four different things I was trying to get to, but 
I kind of lost it. Sorry, y'all. One, um, one thing that is amazing through all this uh, for me personally is, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we've been working on the solving the mystery of how life began. Well, and, and the paper, is a, uh, you can find it online. It's called The Hot Spring Hypothesis for the Origin of Life. I, I put my name in there and you'll, you'll find it. It's uh, open access. But what happened was as we were discovering that we could create short pieces of, of RNA uh, and peptides and the, all the other important polymers of life through wet dry cycling in these hot spring like environments and now in the New Zealand setting itself. So we, we discovered how nature through self assembly could make the polymers to get life going. And now we've got empirical evidence that it was through a wet dry cycling pool. Kind of like Darwin's warm little pond, but but drying out where everything gets concentrated and sandwiched together in a bathtub ring and then forms the polymers that we need and then puts them into protocells and then cycles those trillions of protocells and you get the engine that can lift life. Well, Dave, uh, Dave Deemer, my colleague at UC Santa Cruz, woke up one day and said, we've just discovered a way to produce one of the most important therapeutics uh, of this century, which is called SIRNA, silencing RNA. And silencing RNA has been used in clinical <laughs> for Huntington's disease uh, successfully. The problem is they're making it using enzymes, using the active processes of life itself. And it's very costly, it's like 500,000 per patient per year for the Huntington's treatment. And Dave spun a company out two years ago uh, from campus that is now taking this clue we got from the origin of life of how the first genes express through template copying. And he's starting to crank out what we think are exact copies of short pieces of RNA, almost like on a wheel of wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. And he's about two thirds of the way through. His lab is shut down. He can't, they can't do any bench work right now. But we've been on calls. Uh, we were on a call this weekend with uh, a founder of another company that's very interested in taking those short pieces of RNA and putting them in a package called an exosome. And then that is a delivery, a drug delivery technology to get those little short pieces of RNA into cells. And guess what they can do? They can cleave any virus, any viral messenger RNA can be attacked by a directed little 21 hair length piece of siRNA getting into that cell, getting taken to where the virus is trying to make a copy of itself or its capsid and cutting it. It's a universal antiviral. Just like in the 20s and 30s of the last century, we got, we got antibiotics, antibiotics, which saved a billion lives, at least in the last hundred years. We may be on the verge of an antiviral. And it was actually going back to, to ask the question of how life itself started that we found the simplistic mechanism that led to viruses, that led to cells, that led to everything. And we found a simple lock and key that we can use to basically face this existential threat again at the universal level over and over again. Because we can generate this siRNA in bulk, bulk micro, uh, milligram or kilogram quantities at next to no cost and get it into people's systems to fight these viruses as they evolve. So this time, so now what we're doing is taking a, uh, we're gonna develop a package to go to potential investors to accelerate the work that Dave has done. So in this time, we have linked the origin of life to our future because we found this lock and key. Maybe the field itself said, okay, now it's time for you to discover how to defend yourself against the biggest existential threat other than yourselves and your own psychology. And here it is. And we can potentially accelerate and rush such a solution into, into healthcare in five years. I have to go through animal testing and a lot of work, but I just wanted to conclude with that, that this perhaps embodies uh, how well humans are, how adaptable we are, how clever we are, and how self-knowing we are. Uh, if we conquer all viruses, it'll be a big deal. 
It's like conquering polio or uh, another major affliction that took our species down for thousands of years. If we conquer the viral threat, it's a major breakthrough for us in this century. And perhaps we can only do that because we're being focused on the issue now. So, and, and with that, uh, I wanted to thank you all so much with, for coming out with uh, such a uh, short notice uh, for this little levity salon. If you'd like to continue, uh, we actually, we usually just held these within my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Bruce Damer. And I just decided to make this one public and open for everyone. I would love to see you in our Patreon community. We do a lot of sharing and neat stuff goes on and these conversations go on. But I certainly am planning to have more of these open conversations uh, from this point on. And I know uh, Charles is working on uh, what should we publish on this? Chat books, illustrated books, comic books. Uh, uh, Juliana is working on media. How should we reinvent media, get some of this information out, this format? And Catherine here is you know, working on this, our community here. I mean, we can document how we rebuild community here. You know, the things that Alan and Son up the road have done for long periods of time uh, in, this, in these mountains. Um, so with that, uh, if it's all right, I was gonna open up, unmute everyone. So maybe we could all take another collective deep breath or two and just write a little bit of relief perhaps at the end of the breath, express uh, the joy that I feel being with you and having this communication and community with you. Um, I think I'll just, I'll just uh, unmute the whole gang. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for the Thank you, Bruce. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Defined gouges. Gouging is anything over 17 cents from last year's price. <laughs> 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 hey, you want to run these on? Good luck to you all. This is Thanks for a wonderful time. conversation. Yeah, let's do this again. I hope to do it Gracias. Thank you. Thanks, all. See you next time. See you all. I tell you what, she's got them cleaned up too. She does. <laughs> oh yeah. Are you ready to leave? Yeah, Bruce. Bye, Alan. Later, friends. Thanks for coming. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> Onward, downward, and the sand of the message is at the end of that whole thing. What happened? Oh, not much. Onward, downward? Onward, downward, it's gone. I don't know. I didn't want to just say goodbye to you. Dennis and Kevin. Sorry. Bye. 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 Say hi to Gary. Bye. Bye. Wondering why the psychedelic community yeah. is somewhat insular and trying to figure out how it's mm -hmm. Well, you can always go to the water Hey, Bruce, I was wondering where your space is. Is there a website or? Is there a website you're I'm not only not ordered. I have um, uh, forgotten to go grocery shopping. I haven't slept since the uh, day before yesterday. Why? Dude, I'm closing deals. Yeah, I stick up day and night to make this shit happen. I've got a whole team <laughs> that's dealing with just Chinese time, yeah. time zone, and time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Night owls are flapping along. Yeah, but I'm dealing with you.
Parents and Carrie and Benny Festival. So, I did third party verification. You can mute this box first. Okay. <laughs> 